Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our Tuesday night Tanya series. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our Tuesday night Tanya series. We've uh, gone into chapter 35 last time. And before we continue in chapter 35, I will give a little synopsis of the first section of 35. Over here, the Alter Rebbe discusses the, one of the most difficult dilemmas facing the Bainini. The Bainini is that the hero of the Tanya, the person who is a regular person, like me and you, who uh, continuously puts up a fight against his evil inclination, against his evil inclination, and always wins. He never sins. He never succumbs to the temptation of the evil inclination. And as he does this, gets closer and closer to Hashem, expecting that one day he will be able to overcome the Nefesh Bahamis or the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, his tem evil temptations, his, or sinful temptations, only to find out in the Tanya, in the first chapters, that that is a fantasy and that won't happen. He will never become a Tzadik. Which means... That to the last day of his life, to the, his last breath, he will deal with temptation and he'll never be able to vanquish that side of him and uh, become literally one with Hashem like the tzaddik does. And this to him is a great frustration. And the Alter Rebbe addresses in the beginning of this chapter, he says to them, and they ask, the question that's asked is why did God put us down here on this earth for a perpetual struggle, one that we cannot ever win. We can never get rid of this evil inclination. That would be like putting a soldier in the front lines and telling him, go fight, but you can't win. It doesn't make any sense. Why would God do that? So Dr. Rebbe is going to answer this question in the next few chapters. <clears throat> Why is the Bainini sent down to this world? What does God want from the Bainini ultimately? In order to understand this, Dr. Rebbe begins by quoting a Zoharic statement of the Yinuka. Yinuka is a young boy, young man, who said as follows. Basically, what the Yinuka was, he, was, uh, he uh, quoted, he used a quote in the Pesach in Ecclesiastes, I believe it is, maybe Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, where King Solomon says, Hachocham, the wise man, his eyes are in his head. And the Yunuka, of course it's in his head. We're then with a... Yeah, we did. I'm giving a synopsis <coughs> just because of... And he uh, he says that the Yunuka said, he quoted King Solomon, who said, the eyes of a, man, of a wise man are in his head. The question, of course, with them is that, of course, every man's eyes are in his head. But what he really meant was that w the eyes of the wise man are, that, are, are, are focused on that which is above his head. What's above our head? The Shekhinah, God's presence, God's light. But the problem is, God, for the light to keep burning, you need to provide oil. So the body of the Jew is the wick. Above our head is the fire, God's light, God's fire. And... Good deeds, our mitzvahs, provide the oil to keep the light of Hashem burning above us. A beautiful idea, nice. The problem is, al Tareb is going to ask, and he asks, the reason you need, of course you need oil for any burning fire, for any candle, you need oil. You need a substance that keeps the, the, the fire burning. But I understand why the Torah and the mitzvahs are God's oil, because it's godly. So it would work perfectly to be absorbed and be one, you know, to become the, the oil for Hashem's fire. That makes perfect sense. But the question is, why do we need the Torah and the mitzvahs to be our oil? Why don't we suffice with the neshama itself, which is also 
godly. It's the godly soul. The soul of the Jew, which is a piece of God. Why can that serve to be the oil for the light of Hashem that's above our body, which is the wick? It would be a wonderful trial. The body is the wick. The soul, the neshama, is the oil. And God is the fire. He provides the fire, and it's a wonderful relationship. Why do we need, why can't the neshama serve as the oil? Why do we need Torah and mitzvahs to serve as oil? So the Altarebbe began explains like this. <clears throat> what is oil? The nature of oil. Why does oil, why can't you put water in the to serve as, <coughs> to keep the fire going. First of all, the water will ex extinguish the fire. But it's more, more than that. You need a substance that could be absorbed into the fire and become, and, and totally subs become subsumed in the fire. Like what we would say, surrender to the fire. And be willing to lose its own existence into the fire. And that's what oil is, the nature of oil. It comes totally absorbed in the fire, and it has its own surrender. It doesn't, it, it ceases to exist, quite literally. The neshama doesn't have that quality. The neshama is an entity unto its own. It's a spiritual entity, a godly entity, but an entity on its own it is. And as such, it cannot serve as oil for the light of God because it will always remain a separate entity. And it can't be subsumed in that light because it goes against its grain. Its grain is to be an ashama, a separate entity, which, you know, gives life to the, to the to human, to the yid, and so on. Torah mitzvahs, on the other hand, are perfect oil, so to say, for Hashem's light. Because what's the nature of Torah and Mitzvah? So we hear the Alter Rebbe begins to explain an interesting thing. And I want to start from this point today, okay? Let's read it in, in the Alter Rebbe's words. It's on page 159, in the middle of chapter 35. The, full, the left column, four lines from the top of the, of the column, at the end of the line. It begins with, it is. You have the Tanya? Ah. It is different, however, with the commandments and good deeds, the mitzvahs, which are his blessed will. His blessed will is the source of life for all the worlds and creatures. Let me explain what he's going to say here. I explained this already last week also, but very quickly. Every... Every action we do, we do it because we want to do it. We want to do it. You want to go to work every morning. You want to go to the gym every morning. Why do you go to the gym? To meet nice people. Yes. To do exercise. Okay. Why do you want to do exercise? To be healthy. So, well, you, why do you go to the gym? To lift weights, to drive, go on a bicycle, to run on, to do, to do jogging on the on the conveyor, whatever it's called, the, the, the treadmill and so on. Do you want to do that? You want to lift weights? Yes, you want to lift weights. You want to go on the track? Yes, I want to do that. Is that really what you want? No, it's not really what you want. It's not your ultimate will. That's the secondary will. The ultimate will is to be healthy, to gain more, to be a healthy human being. Same with the business. You go to work. Why do you go to work? So I want to go out. I want to make a sale. I want to make sales. I want to. Why do you want to make sales? That's what you want to do. You want to make sales. That's it. That's the end. No, of course that's not the. The end is the money. The, even the and even the money is not the end. The money. What you do with the money. So every will that have, everything we do has a, a, a secondary will, and a, and the and the ultimate. Because it's called in Hasidus, the Chetpnimius the inner will, and the Chetzenius the outer will. The whole world that we God created, what's that? That's that that's Hashem's will. He didn't. He wouldn't want it. He wouldn't create it. But that's not his inner will. 
That's the external will. The inner will is Torah and Mitzvahs. That there should be Jews that fulfill Torah and That's the business. That's the that's the dollar at the end of the day. That's what he wants. That's the problem. That means that everything outside of Torah and Mitzvahs is God's external will. Now, in order to get this world created, he did a lot. There was a whole process of evolution. Evolution of the spiritual world. First, he had to contract his infinite light so that there can be a possibility for a finite re, uh, result, which is the, phys- the, the finite world spiritually first, spiritual worlds first, and then the physical world. And this is all concealed. His, his essence is concealed in all of this and so on. All this was done. Why? Because he wants Torah and Mitzvah. So in other words, the Torah and Mitzvah really is the energy of the world. If not for the Torah and Mitzvah, there would be no desire for the world. It's like if there's no money to be made in this business, the desire for the business is goes down the dump. It's, it's, it's closed. You close it up and finish. So the same thing with the world. The whole, everything in this world, this table, these chairs, the animals, the, the, everything, even angels, everything is there, the energy for that, the lifeline for all of this is Torah Mitzvahs. You take that away, the, everything comes to an end. So that becomes the energy of the whole world. Okay, let's learn it inside first. It is, however, di- different, however, with the, the commandments and good deeds, which are his blessed will. His blessed will is the source of life for all the worlds and creatures flowing down to them the life is flowing down to them through many contractions, or tzimtzumim in Hebrew. And the concealment of the countenance, Hashem conceals his inner dimension, so to say, of the supreme will, of his internal will. Blessed be he. And the recession of the, of the levels until it was made possible for creatures to come into being ex nihilo. Ex nihilo means something from nothing. Separate beings that should not lose their identity as discussed above. That's what Hashem wanted. If you want Torah mitzvahs, you have to create wood to be a, which, with which you build a sukkah. So in order to have the mitzvah of sukkah, you have to have wood. And you need schach, which is the, the greenery, you know, the, the branches. You need a whole world to get to that. You need the Home Depot to go buy the wood. So everything is all in order to have a sukkah. Right? And the same thing with so many other mitzvahs. You want to have Jews, the, the mitzvah of eating matzah on Pesach. So you have to have tractors and you have to have fields and you have to have people watering the fields and rain and till the, the grain grows and they cut the wheat and the wheat goes. You need bakeries and you need wood to fuel the, 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 the bakery oven and you need. There's a million things till you get the matzah. But all that is just for the matzah. That's the, it what he really wants. That's the inner will, okay? So let's read that again. His blessed will, the seventh line. His blessed will is the source of life for all the worlds and creatures flowing down to them. Those, 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 uh, that, ble- that life, life force flows down to them through many contractions, simsumim, and the concealment of the countenance of the supreme will, Ratzon Elyon. He has to conceal all that, because if they wouldn't conceal it, and Hashem would be too revealed, nothing else would be able to come and merge into existence. And the recession of the levels, until the one thing down, down to the next, all the, this whole evolution of all the spiritual levels, until it was made possible for creatures to come into being ex nihilo, physical something from nothing, Separate beings that should not lose their identity as discussed above. Because if he didn't contract himself and he didn't conceal himself, nothing would come, it would, everything would lose its identity in his reality. So he has to conceal himself. The commandments, however, that's everything till the commandments. This table, the chair, it's all concealed. The life force in this chair is all concealed. You see God when you look at the chair, even though you know there's a spark of God in that chair that's giving it life, that's the the, the life force of that chair. 
But this is not his ultimate will. So it's not really him. So it's an external, what's, what spark of life of God is in that chair and this table and this coffee? It's an external part of Hashem, which is concealed. However, look at the next thing, the commandments, however, are different in that they are the inwardness of his blessed will. That's the ultimate will. That's really what he wants, without any concealment of the countenance whatsoever. His will is him. His inner will is one with him, his inner self. And there could be no separation between him and his will. It's not an external part of him, it's an internal part of him. The vitality that is in them, therefore, is in no way a separate independent being, independent thing, but is united and absorbed in his blessed will. And they become truly one with a perfect union. So the mitzvah is, when a yid does a mitzvah, that is one, literally one with Hashem. And that's absorbed within Hashem. Hashem and the mitzvah, and the, that, that whole thing. And not only the mitzvah itself, but the man doing the mitzvah. His power of action that's making the mitzvah, doing the mitzvah, all is absorbed in oneness with Hashem in the most profound way. And that is why that serves as oil. Because the nature of what you need are the combustible, right? You need something that can lose its identity in the fire. In mitzvahs, you have that. There's no separateness in mitzvahs. There's no separateness in mitzvahs. So, so it serves as perfect oil. The neshama is not like that. The soul is a separate entity. Whereas Hashem's will is not a separate. His inner will is not a separate entity. Who was the first to put forth this notion that the physical world arose out of God's contraction? It's talked about the Kabbalah Sarizal. Sarizal? Yeah. Sarizal elaborates greatly on the topic of Tzimtzum. What is Tzimtzum? Contractions. Where Hashem held back his inward will. His, his uh, infinite will. Contraction. Remember, we learned in the Kabbalah series. Why would he do that? Because he needed to. If he would not do that, everything would be infinite. To separate to separate the finite from the infinite. <clears throat> now, the meaning of the indwelling. Now, what does it mean that Ash? Now, the meaning of the indwelling of the Shechina. When we say when we say that something dwells, that Hashem's presence is dwelling somewhere, the indwelling of the Shechina is the revelation of His blessed divinity and of the light of the blessed Himself in anything. When you say Hashem dwells in something, yeah. What does it mean that Hashem is dwelling in this particular thing? He says, the meaning of the indwelling of the Shechina is the revelation, the revelation of the of His blessed divinity, and of the light of the blessed Ein Sof in anything. Where Hashem is revealed, that's where the, that, that that's the Shechina is present. Where His His presence is revealed. Don't forget, He's present everywhere, but He's not revealed. Indwelling of the Shechina means that is the revelation of his blessed presence. That is to say, that such thing merges into the light of God. What does it mean that Hashem is the, 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 uh, revealed in something? He's, he's present, his revealed presence. Of. It means that that something is absorbed, merges into the light of God, and its reality in, is completely dissolved in him. Let's read a few more lines. Only then does the one God abide and manifest himself in him. It means like this. Hashem is not going to be revealed or present where 
there is separateness. Where this, in other words, in order for Hashem to be present somewhere, really present, meaning revealed, that something has to surrender to Hashem's reality completely. Hashem is not present where there's something else in existence as a separate entity. Hashem is there, it's to the exclusion of all else. It's only. So the moment you're not, something is not surrendered to Hashem, he's not, you kicked him out. He's not there. It's what we call bittle. We learned this in chapter 6 already, great length over there. What is something, when saying something is holy, what does it make something holy? Why is this, this building holy and uh, your house is not holy? Why is this building holy and the outside is not? Because there's a godly presence here. Right? What does holy mean? Holy means where God's presence is revealed. And where is God's presence revealed? In only in an entity that is totally surrendered to him. If you say to Hashem, I'll let you in, but I have, you know, you and me can be here. <laughs> I'll make room for you, but I'm not giving you exclusivity. Thanks, but no thanks. There's no such thing. It's either him or not him. But there's no, there's, he's not sharing space with anyone. He's not spare sharing anyone. It's surrender or not. You're, you you surrender to Hashem's presence, you you brought him in, you invited him in. What does it mean to surrender? Totally connect to Hashem's will. Do what he wants. Do what he wants without an ego. In an egoless place, Hashem is there. Where the ego exists, he's not there. Now, does this chair have an ego? No, chairs don't have ego. The only people that have, the only entity that has an ego is you and me, is, is human beings. So again, if we use these entities, these all these things in, in our, at, at our possession, at our disposal, we use this for our own ego, then we chase Hashem out of these things. If we use them to promote Hashem's presence, Hashem's will, Hashem's desires, we invited Hashem in. It's that simple. So with his bitl to Hashem, surrender to Hashem, you brought him in. You revealed that his presence is revealed. You don't have surrender to Hashem, his presence is not revealed. Which means he's not there. <coughs> he's there, he's everywhere, but he's not there. I was confused with this notion of uh, that anything could be truly separate. God's creation is unified, and he's in, and he's both in and so the answer is chapter 22. You were here. Right, right. Remember, you just explained it now. It's not that it's separate. It's just that God is either revealed or not revealed. It is separate. That's it's called separation. What okay. do you, what's called separation? It's not that. That's ultimate separation. It's separate in that it's remote. It's, it's not. In other words, you're in touch with his external <laughs> okay. will rather than his internal will. Or that Al Rebbe called in chapter 22 his backside rather than his front side. Remember, we talk about behind the back relationship. So, this, so I guess again, it's another one of these, these cases where when you use the word separate, it can mean certain things. And now I realize separate means is away and away from God and not revealed. Which, which means separate. That's being, what separate means. Right. It's, separate. it's sort of like separate is given. In other words, it's not a different case. It's just, it's not It's not objectively different. It is separate or separated or away from God. It's right. distant from God. Yeah. Right. That's right. what I was confused. So I'm glad you that way. No problem. Again, the circle. Now, the meaning of the indwelling of the Shekhin is the revelation of the, his blessed divinity and the, of the light of the blessed Ein Sof in anything. That is to say that such thing merges into the light of God 
and its reality is completely dissolved in him, in, in God. Only then does God, the one God abide and manifest himself in it, manifest as we will. But anything whose reality is not complete, completely nullified in him, the light of God does not abide nor manifest itself therein. Even if one be a perfect tzaddik, listen to these words, this is really interesting. Even if one be a perfect tzaddik, who cleaves to him with abundant love, since no thought can truly apprehend him at all, for the truth of the Lord is the true God. And it, it, for the truth of the Lord is the true God, is his unity and oneness. That he is one alone and there is no reality whatsoever apart from him. That's the ultimate truth. So if you're part of that truth, then you're one with him. Then you, you know, you're there. Hence the perfect tzaddik. I'm sorry, hence the person who loves God. And ipso facto exists apart and is not null and void, cannot by his thought apprehend him at all. And the light of God cannot abide and reveal himself in, itself in him. That means he's describing over here the tzaddik. Let's try to discuss the tzaddik without Torah and mitzvahs. Let's talk about, theoretically speaking, before the Torah was given, there were tzaddikim in the world. There were. There were. Neyach was a tzaddik. Sushalach, Nesudal was a tzaddik. There were a few. Chanoich was a tzaddik. In what way were the tzaddik? There were no mitzvahs. So how did, what, what, how did they, can, what, what, what does it mean they were tzaddik? So let's understand. Let's, let's describe it. They loved Hashem like a tzaddik loves Hashem. They cleaved to him. They thought about him. They couldn't get enough of him. They were totally lovesick for Hashem. The yeah. highest level of love. Even if they did, they didn't. It doesn't make a difference. It's the point is that they were totally attracted to Hashem. Now, Tereb is saying over here, with all the love and with all the attraction, with all that said, they cannot really grasp Hashem. Why not? Because Hashem is, where's Hashem manifest? How do you grasp Hashem? If you're a separate entity, you can't grasp Him. You can only grasp Him if you are absorbed within Him. When we talk about Hashem's oneness, you remember chapter 20, 21, the letters in the source, right? Remember all that? Hashem's oneness is that there's only Him. The tzaddik is not only Him. The tzaddik is a separate entity. He feels he is an entity that loves Hashem. It's a very lofty entity, but it's a separate entity after all. So, with, so, so left to our own devices, we can never really grasp Hashem and become one with Him. There's only one way to become dissolved in Hashem. How? No, by now you should know already. No, a Torah and mitzvahs. When the tzaddik or the yid does teira mitzvahs, in that act he becomes one with Hashem. Because the teira mitzvahs are an inner will. There's nothing separating between him and, him and Hashem. The, the, the mitzvah and Hashem. So when you're in touch with that mitzvah, you're in touch with Hashem himself at the highest level. Because there's no separation. And everything else is the outer will. It's an external will. It's not Hashem himself. It's not real, that's not where he really is. There's an external part of him there. Where is his ultimate desire? His ultimate will is in the Tater and Mitzvahs. That's where you have him. That's where he's truly manifest. Which means, that's where there's absolutely no separation. We made, we said, the only place where Hashem is manifest, where it's bottled to him, where there's total surrender to him. That's in Tater and Mitzvahs. Because nothing else is really surrendered to him. And the Shomat's so own devices is a separate entity. But that's only while the Mitzvah is done. When the Mitzvah's happened. Yeah. Yeah. When the Mitzvah's happened. And Atzadik is doing mitzvahs all the time. Robert, a question. You said before I mean, that... Not all the time. He's doing mitzvahs a lot of the time. And even when he's eating and drinking, it's also directed towards God. So it's also in a way... But there's no way that we'll ever be part of God because the Nisham is a separate entity. The Nisham and not, but through Teira Mitzvah, that's when you become one. Yeah, but then when you pass away, you, what happens? 
we're not doing mitzvahs. You're not doing mitzvahs. Yeah, but what happened to the Nisham? The Nisham is still, it goes up to, to heaven. It's a separate yeah. entity, correct? So the previous Rebbe said when, uh, actually this is something else, but it said that the Nisham once had a teacher that asked us a very interesting question. I was a little kid, I remember this. It was uh, after an uncle of mine died. He died young. I was 10 years old. And I was in the school. And the teacher was trying to bring out the power of Torah and Mitzvah. So he asked us, what would happen if Hashem told all the souls in heaven that he's going to send them down for 24 hours? You got 24 hours to be down here on earth. What do you think they're going to go do? So we all thought right away, and I was talking, I was thinking about my uncle. He'd go right, he'd go there to the house, he'd spend time with his family, right? Yeah. That's what most people would answer. He answered no, they wouldn't even do that. They would do Tayra Mitzvah all day long. Because never they can't anymore. The, the problem is over there, they know the, 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 the value of it. See, down here, what we could do is we don't know the value of it, or we don't feel it. In heaven, they feel the value of this. So if God released and the Sham is down here for 24 hours, they wouldn't go there anywhere but to, to do, they would be engaged 24 hours in Mitzvah and Tayra. Because they know the value of it. It made an impression on me then. I remember it till today, 50 years later. Or whatever. But that's the truth, because the, you're asking a good question. The Nisham in heaven is not able to connect to God at this level. What you can do here in the morning at 7 o'clock with your film or with whatever mitzvah you do, the Nisham is in heaven not dying to be able to do that. It's not a joke. What was your question? I think his prophet to do mitzvah. Is getting, he's getting people to do mitzvah. His prophet? Mitzvah. Why did he create the mitzvah? He created the prophet. Oh, the prophet. Okay, prophet. got it. He's getting people to do mitzvah, but not keeping them. True. He doesn't want to, right. Correct. Overcoming him to, to do mitzvah. They have a fight for a mitzvah. Correct. Yes. Shadiks don't have that fight. Well, they did. They don't have that kind of fight, but they have challenges. Well, but my question is, the mitzvahs done by the, the tzaddiks, is it less valuable? Probably, probably. Less In a way, you can, from one perspective, yeah. Yeah. On the other perspective, though, those mitzvahs are done with tremendous love. So it has a lot of fire to it. So there's, 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 a, lot of, there's a lot of value to those mitzvahs, obviously. But the value of fighting to do a mitzvah and the challenges that come along with the evil inclination, that the tzaddik overcame. He doesn't have that challenge anymore. He has obstacles. He has obstacles. Like what? It's those difficulties. Is the Do previous rebbe, the previous rebbe, in Russia, they stayed, well, they almost killed him for doing mitzvahs. He had to. It was a serious nefesh. It was self sacrifice to do a mitzvah. Those are major challenges. So he doesn't have internal challenges. He doesn't have internal, but he has yeah. external challenges. A whole many. That's, that's, a that's also very valuable. So no one's free of challenges. But the tzaddik is free of his internal challenges. That's true. I like that. You said it well. The internal and external. I thought when they created Cain, they didn't want that stone. They did that. To, he did want bonus, that. The bonus points of the stone. That's the bonus. So ultimately, God wants a dwelling place down here in this physical world. And where's the lowest? In, a, in, in challenge. That's the, that's the lowest, where there's an opposition to God, and you overcome it. That's tremendous uh, value. Okay. So let's go again from this circle. Now, the meaning of the indwelling of the Shechina. Is the revelation of his blessed divinity and of the light of the blessed things of in anything. That is to say, that's, that such things merges into the light of God and its reality is completely dissolved in him. Only then does the one God abide and manifest himself in it. But anything whose reality is not completely nullified in him, the light of God does not abide nor manifest itself with therein, itself therein. 
even if one be a perfect tzaddik who cleaves to him with abundant love, since no thought can truly apprehend him at all. So even the tzaddik can, for the truth of the Lord is the true God, is his unity and oneness, that he is one alone and there is no reality whatsoever apart from him. Hence, the person who loves God and ipso fact exists apart. You love Hashem means there's a you who loves Hashem. It means ipso fact that you exist apart and is not null and void. So he cannot by his thought apprehend him at all. And the light of God cannot abide and reveal itself in him except through the fulfillment of the commandments which constitute in reality his blessed will and wisdom without any concealment of count. Let's skip the note for a minute. Therefore, when a person occupies himself in the Torah, his neshama, which is his divine soul, with her two innermost garments only, namely the power of speech and thought, because those are the two garments that are engaged in learning Torah. It's not an action. It's with your mind or with your mouth, right? So this, again, his neshama, which is his divine soul, with her two innermost garments only, namely the power of speech and thought, are absorbed in the divine light of the blessed in self and are united with it in a perfect union. This constitutes the resting of the shechina <coughs> on his divine soul. As the rabbi stated, even if one person sit sedulously, Okay, occupies himself with the Torah sedulously, right? That is the, no, it's not. It's S E. Sedulously, sedulously. Right. Occupies himself with the Torah. The Shechina is with him. Page one sixty one. So what? What is on there? With, with devotion, I guess, totally. Oh, it means to do with devotion, probably. It's like this, it comes from the same word, the word sedulous. It's like... It's, it's occupied, with, very yes, strong. With great with focus. Yeah. Yeah. Very focused and with energy. Yeah. So it's through the Torah that that happens. However, in order to draw the light and effulgence of the Shechina also over his body and animal soul. Till now we spoke about the Neshama becoming one with Hashem through Torah. But you also want to bring down the light of Hashem and connect your body and your animal soul with the, with the inner dwell, dwelling of Hashem. And that's what he's going to address now. However, in order to draw the light and effulgence of the Shechina, also over his body and animal soul, in other words, over the vital spirit clothed in the physical body, he needs to fulfill the practical commandments of action which are performed by the body itself. Putting on film, eating matzah, chewing matzah with your body. There's the mitzvahs that you do with your brain and your mouth that's a little more refined, more spiritual. Those are the two inner garments, thought and speech. But in order for you to bring and to connect to bring the light of the Shechina into your body and your animalistic soul, to that you have to do the body mitzvahs, which are the action mitzvahs. That's what he's saying. now. He needs to fulfill the practical commandments which are performed by the body itself. For then, the very energy of the body itself, which is engaged in this action, is absorbed in the divine light and in his will, and is united with him in a perfect union. So there you got that when you do the mitzvahs that you with your body, you light Shabbos kind, you light a menorah, you do, you you give charity, you, whatever it is you do, put on tefillin. Do, do you mind going back to one fifteen in one second there? Because that question for me is, is the last paragraph is before the note. Yeah. And <clears throat> there's and the light of God cannot abide and reveal itself in him except through fulfillment of commandments. And then at the end, with, without any concealment. Of countenance. countenance. Yeah. You mean this shows his face? Right. 
there's God no show, God shows his face. Yeah, there's no there's no concealment. Yeah. So I'm going to give you more awareness of it. You may not be able to say, be aware of it. Thereby, he says, the, so this is, he said, this is the third garment of the divine soul, which is the garment of action, right? Thereby, also the energy of the vital spirit in the physical body originating in the klipa snega is transformed from evil to good. What's going on in the air? When you put on tefillin, yeah, let's try to describe this for a minute so we get the picture. When you put on tefillin, what's, how do you put on tefillin? You're going like this and you're tightening the thing. It, there's an action involved. There's an energy in your hands moving. There's a life force that is the life force of your, en- of your human soul in the body is active. It's actually is, is active in putting on tefillin. Where did that life force come from? Where does it originate in? In Klippa. It's the human soul, the animal soul, not the godly soul. And that originates in Klippa. So when you add Klippa force is energizing the putting on of tefillin, what's happening? You transform that negative into positive. Thereby also the energy of the vital spirit in the physical body originating in the Klippa's nega. It's transformed from evil to good and is actually absorbed into holiness like the divine soul itself. It's amazing. Since it, in, it is this animal soul that carries out and performs the act of the commandment. Because without it, without the animal soul, act, you know, the energy and the, the life of the body, the divine soul could not have been acting through the body at all. The, act, the, the godly soul needs the animal soul to work. One second. For it is... For it is spiritual, the godly soul is a spiritual soul, while the body is material and coarse. So it needs the agency of the human soul, which is much closer to the body, to work through it to do the mitzvah. But where does that energy from the human soul come from? Klippa. So it's using the klippa to do a mitzvah. You're transforming bad into good. The intermediary. But this is klippa's nega. This isn't like klippa's. Klippa's nega. Yeah, you can't yeah, trans. This is the really bad. N- the right. The bad klippa you have to stay away from. Those are the 365 you can elevate, you can elevate by staying snake. away from it. Oh, you can elevate Klippa Snake by direct engagement, yeah. So Rabbi, the Sadiq has Klippa Snake also? Yeah, sure. They were bodies. Absolutely. See, it says this human soul is the intermediary linking them the intermediary linking between this, this purely spiritual godly soul and the physical body is the vital animal soul, which is clothed in the human blood, in the heart, and in all the body. You want to go further? Let's go a little bit further. Maybe we can try to finish the chapter. Try to finish this chapter. chapter yeah, hopefully. It's not that much longer. That's a record. <laughs> it's not so bad. But this is the year of chapter 34. No, it isn't. It's the month. <laughs> and although he says, the look at these words. Things happen in an instant. He's going to say something very important. And although the essence and substance of the animal soul in his heart. So what did he say? When you do the mitzvah, you're using the vital animal soul to do the mitzvah. You're transforming it into good. He says, not so fast not a total transformation it says and although the essence and substance of the animal soul in his heart namely its evil dispositions have not yet been absorbed into holiness when you put on film in the morning yeah does that mean you no longer have any temptations your no. animal soul is shut out finished it's transformed completely well not at all not by a you know, long shot nasty piece of work. we're all a nasty piece of work <laughs> So, yeah, you're utilizing the vitality of the animal soul right now for holiness, but the essence of it, the substance of the divine, the animal soul, has not been transformed at all. It still wants to have a good ba- you know, bagel and lox, uh, you know, but uh, for its own passion. That may be worse. <laughs> that's a, not such a bad passion, temptation. 
but it's got very ungodly temptations, even while it's putting on film. He's saying, namely, its evil dispositions have not yet been absorbed into holiness. Nevertheless, since they have submitted to holiness and obeyed unwillingly, respond amen and agree and are reconciled to perform the commandment under the preponderance of the divine soul in his brain, which rules the heart. And in the meantime, these evil dispositions are in a state of exile or slumber, as it were, as discussed above. Therefore, this is no obstacle to the suffusion of the Shechina over the human body at such time. This is a tremendous thing what he's saying over here. This speaks directly to uh, What he's saying over here is like this. When you're involved, here's the question that the al Tareb is addressing. You just told me that not only is the Neshama subsumed into godliness when it does a mitzvah, but even the human soul is. The human soul and the body, when it does a mitzvah, it's, it's, it's dissolved into godliness, right? But he says, wait a minute. When you, when you do tefillin, or any other mitzvah for that matter, your animal soul is completely transformed to godliness. It, there's no separateness there at the moment. There's no feeling of separateness in the animal soul. Ten minutes after you finish putting on film, or maybe ten seconds, you're back to your old temptations. So even when you put on the film, it's not transformed. So how could that become absorbed in godliness? It's a separate entity. It's not only separate, but it's completely foreign to godliness. The animal soul is, by definition, a very self-centered soul. And therefore, it feels itself. It's not subsumed into godliness. So how could you tell me now, even when I'm putting on film, it's subsumed into godliness, not only my soul, my godly soul, but even my animalistic soul and my body? They still have their own issues. Even though I've, uh, for momentarily, they, uh, they're, they're putting on film and you're using the animalistic you know, uh, vitality to put on film, but you didn't transform the, the, the substance of the God, the animal soul into God. So it's, therefore also it cannot sub, submerge into God. It can't be, it's not surrendering to God. So if he doesn't surrender, how could it become one with Hashem? We learned before that in order for Hashem to be manifested, it has to surrender. So that's the question he's going to answer here. And although, again, and although the essence and substance of the animal soul in his heart, namely, its evil dispositions have not yet been absorbed into holiness, nevertheless, since they have submitted to holiness. What happens? You wake up in the morning, and you're interested in going on the stock market, reading the newspaper, but then, you know, your godly soul gives you a zets and says, they need you in shul. Go. Go to shul. And, you know, you roll over and you say, you know what? <laughs> All right, I'll go, to shul. I'll go to shul. So you submit it, yeah? For the moment, you submit it. So he said, nevertheless, since they have submitted to holiness. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll bite unwillingly. You're not really so interested, you know? They, they send you a text on the Chabad of Western <laughs> Times. They need a 10, and you're really not in the mood. And <laughs> <laughs> but you oh get up and God. go. But you get up That's and go because you struggle. have to. Right? You have to so you get up and of, go. We need a lot of points for that. He's describing, <laughs> us, he's describing us in we the need morning. A thousand points for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's saying. Nevertheless, since they have submitted to holiness and will bite unwillingly, you're not even interested. You'd rather sleep. And you respond, Amen, and agree to the, to be to, and agree and are reconciled to perform the commandments. You know, they need me. So I say, okay, Amen, I'll come, you know. <laughs> you agree and are reconciled to perform the commandment of Dabani under the preponderance of the divine soul. Your, your godly soul is also knocking on your head and telling you, get out of bed. Yeah. That's in the brain, which rules the heart. At the end of the day, when you have a fight between the mind and the heart, the mind wins. That's the, that's the nature of it. And in the meantime, these evil dispositions are in a state of exile uh, uh, or slumber. Right now, your temptation for something very ungodly is put to rest, is put to sleep for a second, for an hour, yeah? You're going to shul, you're going to be involved over there, as it were, as discussed above. Therefore, so even though 10 minutes after that, you're going to be right back at it, in this moment, this is no obstacle to the suffusion of the Shekhinah over the human body at such time. 
Because this minute, the negative the, or the separateness is put to sleep. The feeling of separateness from God is not active. So the, right now, what's active is a surrender to Hashem. It's like a tzaddik moment. I don't know about a tzaddik moment, but it's a benini moment. It's a, it's a moment of godliness. The other, the other soul is subdued. Subdued doesn't mean transformed. By tzaddik is transformed. That, this is a benini. This is, this, no, this is a benini moment. This is a moment where the Bainif wins over the battle and says, we'll go on a shul. If you wake up the next but he's saying it's problem. not an obstacle, even though right now <laughs> you know, your whole body and animal soul has become godly, not at all, by no, by no stretch of the imagination. But it's not, that part of the animalistic soul is resting. It's not, a, it's not uh, strong. It's, it's asleep. What, it's subdued for that moment. Yeah, yeah. And that's why it's not an obstacle for the union with Hashem. It, it is. It's not an obstacle to this infusion of becoming one with Hashem. Thus, the energy of the vital soul that is embodied in the performance of the commandment is actually absorbed into the divine light and is united with it in perfect union, thereby illuminating the totality of the vital soul, the totality of the vital soul throughout the body, and also the physical body itself in a manner of encompassing from a... Let's you, finish up it, yeah. You had a moment of not where I saw God. Where I saw God. Do you feel different, or I, we, you know, when you were in the presence of the Rebbe, you felt God. Did you? He, it, was, it was real. It was real. Not that your eyes saw Hashem, but this experience was you were on a higher, higher, on a higher wavelength. Yeah, the Rebbe was so real in his connection to Hashem. That it exuded to everyone else. That energy really passed on to others. How was he selected the Rebbe? That this Shabbos is the big day. This is uh, the big Shabbos where the Rebbe became Rebbe was on this, the 10th of Shabbos. How do they, how, how, we, how yeah, was he selected? I'm going to tell that story on Shabbos. Right? I'm going to tell that story on Shabbos. By the Shabbat dinner. I mean, that's, that's what this whole Shabbat is about. Let's finish this chapter and we'll talk about it. Clearly, any such diffusion, when Hashem is, pre- is when He uh, draws His light onto a person, any such a f- diffusion of the light of the Shechina, that is the revelation of the light of the Blessed Day itself, cannot be turned in mutability in Him. It's not a change in Him, God forbid, nor multiplicity. Witness the passage in the Sanhedrin, in the Talmud. Where a heretic said to Rabbi Gamliel, You say that on every assembly of ten men the Shekhinah rests. How many divine presents do you have? If there's ten people in this room in the Shekhinah rests, and there's ten people a mile away in the Shekhinah rests here, how many Shekhinahs do you have? So he answered him. You understand the question? So he answered and he replied to him with an example of the light of the sun which enters through many windows. The intelligent man will understand. It's one sun. One shechina. It's present everywhere. We have like finished one chapter. Question. Which question? Which one? Oh, he's going to in chapter 36 and 37. These three chapters. Well, in a way you have a little bit of it, but... Uh, that concludes chapter 35, very, very special. And uh, chapter 36 is going to be even better. It's coming, it's coming, yeah. We're getting there. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll be back for more next Tuesday, Gabby. Well, Robert, how many chapters are in-